What's up, everybody? Um, we're here for debate night, but not a formal debate night. I know we've had a lot of crazy debate nights this season, uh, but it seems like people seem to enjoy them. We've had a really busy stretch, and this week in particular, um, we were traveling in Vermont. That is where I was and Silas was as well. Um, and then I had the idea of doing kind of a guest's revenge type episode because <laughs> I've been asking everybody else questions all season long. We've only got a couple episodes left, um, and it's time for them to be directed back at me. So I asked all of the guests and analysts that have been in our show on our chat to kind of bring in either old takes exposed, some new topics or new questions, or even their own takes that, that I can discuss. And I was originally going to discuss them with Brody, though he's not a host, um, yeah, but his flight got delayed. So we improvised yet again. And who else has been on the show? Probably. I mean, gosh, you've probably been on close to as many times as Hunter this year. I think I lost count. I was somewhere in like the 15 or 16. Yeah. So Gary is Gary's joining me because Gary happens to be in town. How convenient for our uh, Heiser Club championship. So um, I brought on the next best thing. Actually better. Ooh. Yeah, actually better. So, um, yeah, we're going to basically go through these. And like I said, I'm going to kind of put myself on the uh, debate end of things for this. And, uh, yeah, we don't have a ton. It'll be not super long, but figured this would be fun. And we've got some pretty good questions in here because, uh, listen, I had our guests really dig deep and, and try to find their most devious take. So we're going to start with one that I think is very devious. This was asked by Dustin. Um, most of you guys know Dustin, mostly from last season. He's been on a few times this season, but won a ton of episodes last season. And uh, he asked what he said. This is revenge for him, me asking a lot of player of the year mm. questions. You did ask a lot of those questions. I mean, can you imagine the look <laughs> on my face when Missy Gannon won? And I was like <laughs> just clenching, like, what do I do now? There's got to be another one. Um, so he said, I think I've crafted the most complicated player of the year question I could think of for ultimate torture. Mm. What player of the year candidate season? I find that interesting because you'll you'll hear why I had to say candidate in a second. Which player of the year candidate season would you rather have? Gannon Burr twenty twenty four, obviously still happening. Isaac Robinson twenty twenty three. So interesting that he throws that in there yeah. and not Calvin's actual winning season. And then Kristen Tatar from twenty twenty three, Kristen Tatar from twenty twenty two, or Paul McBeth twenty nineteen. So which would you rather have? An that's a question. That's a really good question because, and I, it's very telling. I think that he didn't include uh, Calvin from last year because yeah. when we talk about iconic seasons, we think about major wins, yeah. and the fact that Isaac got two, it almost makes you want to put him in this conversation well, more than others. I, and I think the tricky thing is, so if you break it down season by season, you have Gannon twenty twenty four, which mm -hmm. is, in my opinion, the reason Calvin wasn't included is because Gannon's season this year is that and more. Yeah, he's sure. actually done more winning. Um, Isaac 2023, what you get is a multiple major win MPO season mm -hmm. during the toughest era we've known yet. Yeah. So I think that's what you get from that season. Obviously, with Kristen's last two seasons, you have a grand slam in there, mm -hmm. um, but just two dominant seasons in general. I'm actually not – I'd have to think how 2022 compares – didn't, didn't she go wins, six? Did she, did she go six majors in a row? So didn't she win the last she two did. of the year? Yeah, maybe overall more wins. I'd have to mm -hmm. look at that. And then Paul McBeth's 2019, kind of one of his last really dominant seasons as well. This yeah. is a tricky one. Yeah, I mean the other factor to, to play in there is if you just like money. I mean if you pick Gannon's, yeah, you get some good earnings there. Yeah. Um, it's hard for me to put Isaac Isaac's season in this conversation, and I think Kristen 2022. I think it comes down to to Gannon's this year just because of the dominance being known as like to be able to say my season is being known as the the skill that's ushering in like a new era of disc golf yeah or to look at Kristen's season from last year to go grand slam four majors I mean that when we look back in the history books I that's the stuff that's going to be remembered yeah uh so for me I feel like and I think it's also partially do, are we are we getting the player too? Because because if, if we're getting the player too, Gannon's makes a lot more sense because we know we got more. This could be right. the worst season he has in three years, right. for all we know. Um, but if it's not like standalone, I think the answer's got to be either Kristen from last year or Gannon from this year. But 
I, I'm going to say I would love the idea that not only did I win some majors, did I win a ton of events, did I hit the, the earnings record, but I was also known for the, some of the best play we've ever seen. I think I'd take Gannon's year this year. Yeah, it's tricky because Kristen's, the, the one knock you could have against her is I think from the accolade standpoint, it is unmatched. But mm -hmm. the, if, if, if I look at what I, I'm trying to look at each season 10 years from now, that season, the one knock people will probably have against it is, I think 10 years from now, the FPO field will be so much different and so yep. much stronger that I think you'll get the, like Kristen's star, realistically, you get far enough into the sport and people might look at her, her career and a few years and be like, well, yeah, she was playing against nobody at this point. Yeah. Um, Gannon's is a tricky one because it feels like an unreal season, but is he going to top it? in a couple of years mm -hmm. or the next couple of years is, or is that season just literally going to be impossible for the next couple of decades? Like, yeah. it, are we seeing something that's so historic? It's really tough in the moment because we're dealing with a player who is continuously getting better. So mm -hmm. that, that's where it becomes tricky with him. It's like, I don't know, is this the best season he'll have his whole career? Or is this even just, is this just the beginning of it? Yeah. Uh, it's hard to do much better. So I think I still would go with Christian's season just because it was just so dominant that literally the entire season we sat around, we'd, we'd go to pick an event, and it'd be like, well, obviously Kristen's going to win. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty special. Um, and I think Dustin excluded Paul's 2015 season because he figured it would be too obvious. And I think Kristen's 2023 season has a similar vibe. Yeah. So Yeah, I, I, can, I can definitely see that. The, the, point, the point you made about, you know, who knows how many years it's going to be before – people look at Kristen's 2023 season like Paul's 2015 season where there's that it was super dominant, but who was he playing against? We know Paul had great competition in 20, 2015. No one's saying that. And we know that Kristen had solid competition at times in 2023. No one's saying that she didn't have any competition, but there does come a point where where does that balance scale shift? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so one thing I had to mention, I asked when Brody was going to come on the show, I, I asked everybody to dig up takes. And I think Sam, who was on the show quite a bit this season, had a lot of things to dig up and look back at because mm -hmm. Brody was always coming after him for one yeah. year. Yeah. And so he went back and found one of the takes. So they were getting into it about the, the triple Mando on mm -hmm. Maple Hill hole one for a little while. And Brody said at one point, Sam, and this is this quote, Sam, if the scoring separation is not better this year than last year, I will give you $20. Um, and then he wanted to follow up on that because he felt like the numbers were pretty identical. You kind of dug into it a little bit more. So what did yeah. you end up finding? Yeah, so I, I took a look at the, the stats from, from last year to this year, and very interestingly enough, it played significantly easier this year than it did last year. In fact, it's kind of funny because in, in 2023, hole one from like the, the A position they had uh, had a 30 or sorry, had a 13 percent birdie rate and a 31 percent bogey or worse rate in a 53% par rate this year, 53% par rate again, almost exactly, yeah. but a 13 or 31% birdie rate and a 14% bogey or worse rate. So they literally just flipped bogey or worse and birdies with each other. But I have to say, cause some of you may be thinking to yourselves, well, Gary, last year, the weather sucked. Yeah. So that could be part of it. It's definitely going to be part of it. But, the, I mean, the hole played. And this is just when it was playing as a par four this year? Just as a par four this year, yep. Yeah. So you're looking at um, 0. .41 strokes easier this year compared well, the, to last and the, year. The tricky thing is, like, with that metric, when you say bogey or worse, that actually implies more separation than just the birdie, right? So it flip-flopping mm -hmm. does matter because yep. bogey or worse implies potentially more separation than yep. birdie. So I think that would lead us to believe that it actually – had worse scoring separation, correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah, I mean, it kind of feels... Not marginally, maybe, but... Yeah, it feels that way, because the fact that so many more people birdied it felt like the hole was less consequential. Yeah. But, I mean, we saw the hole had its teeth. How many times did we talk about in the first several rounds, or in the, the third round, where Gannon missed that hole? Like, you know, people talked I, about that. And I wonder, because I do... I have to remember back to Brody's argument, but... In my mind, the reason why the scoring separation would go down is because I imagine you would see with a triple Mando, you're going to see more players lay up. Yeah. And in that, in that case, I think you're going to see more pars. Um, 
I, I think Brody's argument was, I remember now he was saying a lot of shots were getting lucky and punching through the woods and making yeah. it back to that area, in, in which case those shots would not do that. But I think a lot of those shots were laid up to the mouth of that triple Mando. Yeah. And I think that's what ended up making the difference. Because I played, I went and played right after that Mando was put in. And it's an intimidating shot. I Two mm -hmm. days in a row threw drives right in front of that thing, but like 200 to 250 out and yeah. like, Unless you're an elite player, it's not. It, it is a big structure, but from that far back, it's tough. Like it's not an easy shot. Yeah, and, and I was out there a few weeks before the MVP Open, and I'll give Brody credit when he said that the trees on the right side were way more thin than they were before. Absolutely right. You, there was a massive gap there. Yeah. And, and so the point that I made on that that debate night was, I feel like the triple Mando makes it so that if you're out of position left or right you're way less likely to go for that gap because there's so much more you have to do to get it in there. Yeah. But what surprised me is I expected to see more birdies, less pars. Mm -hmm. I did not expect to see the same par rate from year to year, yeah. which is kind of interesting. I thought there was going to be more safe play going on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we definitely, I feel like, saw the worst weather this year in round one, mm -hmm. and it was playing as a par three round yep. one. So I think that, that also has an effect on there for sure. Um, Definitely interesting, but I think I think it's safe to say that I don't think you were wrong necessarily, Sam. So yeah, might have to might have to dig that one up with Brody whenever he gets into town. Um, next thing I wanted to bring up: so Jack, who was on the show a few times, notoriously uh, called out as the guy who was reading off of his script by Brody. Mm. I didn't ever had an issue with it, <laughs> um, but that's uh, that was that was Jack. But he dropped his. Uh, power rankings of tour courses this year and wanted us to kind of chime in on that interesting so i am looked at glanced at this and no, noticed at least uh one omission immediately the way i'm going to rank this in my mind is how these courses actually play on tour not mm -hmm. just the course in its own merit um so he has number one fox run meadows number two brewster ridge Right away for the GMC courses. Number three, Maple Hill. Number four, New London Tech. Definitely noticing a theme here. You're going to continue to notice. Mm. Number five, Olympus. Number six, The Beast. Number seven, Northwood Black. Number eight, Eureka Temp. Oh, interesting take. Number nine, Toboggan. Another interesting one. And number 10, Disc Side of Heaven. He said would be higher if they didn't ruin the layout. Eure he said Eureka Temp would be higher if, they, if we only saw it for two rounds. And he said The Beast would be higher if the end of the event with uh there with that finishing stretch not sure what he means by that gotcha exactly but immediately when i look at this i notice there's definitely a lot of wooded courses on his list mm -hmm. um not a huge fan of any of the open tracks i also am very surprised to see eureka temp and toboggan on there yeah. i think those are the only two that are a little criminal in a top 10 and he threw the beast on there but no crocole <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a t well. I wonder was his question specifically for U.S. stops because if he has the beast. Oh, does he mean Waco? Oh, oh, I guess he probably does. He, this is the problem with naming multiple courses the beast. So he probably yeah. this probably is a U.S. based list. Then I could I could yeah. go back and look to double check because I feel like if sense. I feel like if it's all well, I'm kind of surprised world. to see that course up that yeah because <laughs> I I feel like that list people could go all right all right all right and then you kind of get to the bottom you're like wait. Yeah. Wait. And don't get me wrong. I like discuss this side of heaven, but I'm not sure that it goes on that list. Um, but I mean, it's interesting. It, it feels like there's some recency bias there. Yeah, but US. at the same time, I mean, Fox Run and Brewster, I, I wonder sometimes if people feel closer to courses that they could play themselves. Definitely. And so when they watch it, they enjoy it a lot more. Yeah. Um, or courses they may have been to before. So I don't hate the fact that Fox Run and Brewster find his, find the way on the list, and honestly, everyone is entitled to whatever list they want to make. But it is weird to see like Northwood Black so low, and because to, to me, it's hard to argue that Maple Hill, Northwood Black, and New London Tech aren't the top three in some way, shape, or form. If we're sticking to U.S. courses, yeah, there's it, a couple other you could probably sprinkle in there. But whenever I'm kind of formulating this, because yeah, there's two really two categories you could go if you go based on just course design. That's one thing. If you look at what makes an event event intriguing, that's mm -hmm. a whole nother. I think that Maple Hill uh, makes the, it intriguing because you have a few iconic holes and people just love it. Yeah. That is what it is. That's just how it's kind of our Augusta in that sense. Um, I think Northwood Black, at least for me and for most people, it, they find it intriguing because of how punishing it is. Mm -hmm. It's so different than everything else. And I, and I think that because there's just one of them on tour, I think that really helps its case. Um, and then New London... 
that one for me, there's obviously heavy bias, but I did think a lot of the players enjoyed it. And I think watching it at Worlds, I did gain a little bit of a new perspective on it, watching the, the field playing there and realizing, okay, this course actually is designed quite well and it mm -hmm. does really work out. Um, I don't know though. I, I yeah, I, it, it's really tough. And then, like I said, he, he doesn't, you know, give any credit to Glendevere, which I think is a pretty good track yeah. over there. Um, really none of the more open courses, which, which I get, mm -hmm. they're not, they're not as memorable. I mean, especially when you're making a list like this, yep. um, in particular, um, didn't throw Idlewild in there. Yeah, that's a tough one for me because I, Idlewild, while may not be every pro's favorite stop in the world, I think of all the tournaments to watch, I like that one because I feel like anybody could win. Yeah. And so it's it is extremely entertaining event to watch. And I I feel like there's a lot of guys on tour that are like, this is my chance. Yeah. So Idlewild for me definitely goes above some of the ones that are listed there. But yeah, it, but it, I mean, it's no secret that a lot of these, you know, Northeast courses and just East Coast in general mm -hmm. definitely um, kind of dominate the list. Obviously, we didn't get to see WR this year, yep. um, but that would have been, I think, one of my favorites as well. But yeah, some interesting additions there, but not the worst list. It's just, yeah, it's tough. You see Fox Run and Brewster right at the top there. I think I've put, I'd maybe move those down a little bit, but they do really stack up pretty well. And I've just went to play mm -hmm. them. And I mean, they're great courses. I think a lot of people, though, did adjust their perception of Fox Run this year, considering how easy it played, yeah. uh, which after going and playing it in 35 to 40 mile an hour winds, I can tell you for free, um, that course is very, very wind dependent because if there was no wind, <laughs> it would be, I mean, 10 to 15 shots easier. Yeah. It, it, is, it is very dramatic. How, how much that affects it. I wonder it, how his list would have changed if he was also including tour stops that we haven't played yet. So yeah. would would you know USDGC's course be on there? Would yeah. the tour championship course be on there? Because uh, I feel like with his list of inclusions of uh, wooded courses, going to uh, tour championship is played at um, Nevin. Nevin. So I feel like Nevin would be almost perfect for the list he's created. Yeah, yeah, it seems like it. I mean, well, the Nevin layout that they have thrown out in years past is very difficult, mm -hmm. so I, I would agree. But then, yeah, Toboggan is kind of an interesting outlier there. Yeah. Because um, Eureka Temp has its mix. Some people do like that course. Um, but Toboggan, yeah, is an interesting one. I, I, I hear a lot of mixed opinions on mm -hmm. that one. Um, anyways, next topic here. This one comes from Jake. Jake's on the show a lot this year, Jake mm -hmm. Murtal. Um one topic he would like to see covered is whether you think disc golf has peaked in popularity and what would need to happen to keep growing. Also, with the Pro Tour never being profitable, the COVID boom seemingly over, and players getting million-dollar contracts, is disc golf setting itself up to implode financially? Well, to answer the second question, I think what we are seeing right now and what we're going to see uh, for probably a few years is controlled bleeding. Um, yeah. I don't think implosion... Um, there is this relationship between the manufacturers who are still doing fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're going we're to see a lot of things that look like end times because there's going to be layoffs. I know there was some more that I just heard about the other day. There's, there's going to be downscaling, but that's because everybody outgrew. But just yeah. because you outgrow doesn't necessarily you set, doesn't mean you sabotage your business to the point where it's going to fail necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, it just might mean coming back to a, the, the correct normal. So I think we're going to see a lot of what looks like a bleed, but not necessarily an implosion. I don't expect to see that. Yeah, because, I mean, when you think about business in, in general, the way a lot of times works when you have a massive explosion of revenue, profit, record-breaking things, you generally have that spot where you stop and you start to slide back a little bit. And it's all dependent upon how you react to that slide back. And you can tell which companies prepared for that, which ones looked ahead and said, we're not going to overpay on these things. We're not going to overdo on these things. We're going to play chess while everyone else is playing checkers. And when that slight, it's what feels like a recessive uh, slide happens, we're going to be sitting pretty because mm -hmm. we prepared for it. Yeah. We, uh, in fact, what will be really interesting to watch, if you talk about the, the contracts and that kind of implosion, we are going to see something really interesting going on with free agency. I just looked at the mm -hmm. contract tracker yesterday. And let me throw you some names that are up this year. Um, for starters, a lot of people know Isaac Robinson yeah, is up. Big one. Here's some. Here's a company that has some decisions to make, and that's Discraft. Because here's who's up for mm. Discraft this year. You start a little smaller. They got Corey Ellis is up, Adam Hammonds is up, Ezra Aderholds up, mm. Anthony Barella is also up. Ooh. So they've got quite a few names to deal with, and one player whose value has skyrocketed. And I think it's gonna be really interesting to watch 
what, how many guys they're able to keep, how many, how, how much shuffling is going to be. Because the other thing, when you look at the contract tracker that Ulti World does, I mean, because it was already starting to happen last year, but it's just one year deals, mm-hmm. just all the way down. One year deals, one year deals. So there are literally like 40 to 50 players that are just going to be playing shuffleboard, just moving around, signing the next one year deal, just getting what they can. And then next year, there's an even another, there's even more interesting things because Kristen's contract will come up. Ricky's contract Mm -hmm. will come up. And that's where it gets even more interesting because then you have these high value players that signed very long contracts um, pre this kind of downward slide. So then it's going to be interesting to watch that as well. But I I think we're going to see some very interesting, a lot of, uh, Posts along the lines of "I'm playing with a mixed bag this year." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think disc. You're right. Discraft is in an interesting boat because for so long it feels like they've prioritized disc sales. Yeah. Where I mean, obviously they they get champions on their team. They have champions. They got on their a lot team. of names. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say, if you look at the names they have on their team, you go, "That person can move disc. That person can move disc." Absolutely. Yeah. And so, are they going to move in the direction of do we keep the people who are moving the discs? Or do we take a stab at an Isaac Robinson? Do we drop a, you know, a Corey Ellis and Adam Hammes? Mm-hmm. Um, that's going to be very interesting. But kind of to go to like the first part of Jake's question, I feel like the biggest thing that that disc golf could do right now is not overreact. Yeah. And I think they need to make changes that make sense. They need to keep working on making sure that the product is as good as ever for consumers. And they've got to get better at attracting sponsors for mm-hmm. things because yeah. the sponsorship world is where is where things start to blow up it's where you get the money because if they can get more sponsorship money coming in the pro tour can maybe stop adding so much out of cash on their end and i think jeff spring said they added over a million dollars last year yeah um so if they can stop having to funnel all that extra money into the events because they're getting bigger sponsors I think you could start taking baby steps forward. But the biggest thing is that we can't overreact. We can't sit here and go, disc golf's going down. Yeah. The, at the end of the day, as far as a peak in popularity, if you really look at the, you know, if you were to look at a graph, and like for PDGA active members especially, yeah, it could take years, years, lots of years to get back to where things yeah. were during peak COVID times. But at the end of the day, in – you know what it takes to spike popularity of a sport isn't much especially in the social media algorithm era Mm -hmm. uh there's enough people you know all it takes is one person with influence to decide to play disc golf and then at the end what makes it so easy for disc golf to spike is the accessibility if it does if it does get popular all it takes is for somebody to buy a ten dollar disc and head to a free course and that's the thing i think that makes this question so hard to think about is because how do you even measure what is considered a procession because you could look at it by pga um memberships Mm -hmm. that's one thing you could look at it by viewership that's one thing what about disc sales you know we don't know a lot about how these companies are selling with their discs so maybe disc sales are up but viewership's down so like how do you judge what is success and not success what is growth and and decline yeah it is i I think yeah a lot of people view uh what's going on in disc golf right now as like armageddon when it's really like well we're just i i think it's just been a longer skid to the new normal than people expected yeah because it takes a while for things to kick you in the butt a little bit like player contracts expiring for sure needing renewed things like that so I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, so we got a couple questions from you, Gary, because originally this was going to be Brody. So mm. you asked questions. I haven't even read them yet. So I'm going to get. I'm going to explain them and uh, give my take live. <laughs> um, so question number one: A lot of argument has been had this year regarding the punishing nature of OB and how courses should be better designed. Certainly from Eric Oakley. Um, however, the USDGC is known for its punishing OB. While the difference between both the arguments and the USDGC may be nuanced, what makes the OB at USDGC iconic and the other use of OB as poor design and punishing? So the interesting thing with this is, is it's, I think this comes from the disparity between player opinion and fan opinion. Because mm-hmm. if you walk around um, – like the village at USDGC and you, the players will float their way through there. Sometimes they'll come up and talk to us, talk about their round. The guys that play bad at USDGC, they got nothing but disdain for that course. Yep. They hate it. They, they do not have a good time out there. <laughs> um, I genuinely believe that most disc golfers, you find yourself in two categories. A lot of times as a disc golfer, the disc golfer that's so good that getting unlucky breaks is just like ridiculous to them because they know at the right course they're going to win almost every time mm-hmm. again in Burr. 
Uh, it's almost hard for him to compute a roll away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then you've got the players who aren't quite cutting it, and so they just get dominated out there, and that's just frustrating. It's a long day. Um, because I think the fans all love it, but I think there actually is a lot of players who – the reason they like that event is because of the event. The big mm -hmm. galleries, there is history involved, uh, but I really believe that a lot of them don't actually love that course. Uh, even yeah. though the fans do, and it, and it just comes down to how iconic it is, because there's some holes out there that aren't great. I mean, it, like as much as sometimes they play well, you look at a hole like hole 11. That's just basically a field of OB. Mm. And is that really a great hole design? Not really. There's nothing to it. They just place ropes down there. But we've seen it enough times that it's familiar to us. Um, so I do think that the punishing OB type players that would make the argument, they fall into the same category with Winthrop. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's so silenced by the fact that everybody loves the event from the outside. Yeah. Do you, do you think it's added? What adds to that is also the fact that it doesn't change very much. Yeah. So it's not like you're going there every year. It's like, oh, they keep tweaking this stuff over and over again. Yeah. And, and they do, they do make tweaks from time to time. And I think that definitely adds to the frustration yeah. whenever they do. Cause it's like, okay, we were finally settled into one thing. Um, but yeah, no, there's, there's certainly like, I remember one of the things that had people wrought up was a couple years ago, they implemented putting the actual rocks down, mm -hmm. um, to mark OB so that it would be more visual, but then you had half the players who were like, yeah, now we can see the OB better. And half of them being like me being one of them being like, Hey guys, what's going to happen when these rocks are keeping discs in and out of the OB, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. which I thought was just insane. Um, so yeah, I, it is definitely there's a lot of split opinions on it, but there is a lot of players who, who I don't think like it. And I think at the end of the day, though, you got it. You're doing it. You know, you play for the fans, yeah. especially in an event like that. Some events, it's easy to say, well, like how many people are really even watching this? Um, but at USCDC, like it is a big deal and yeah. people want to see that course. Um, so, OK, second question out here. We've heard time and time again, from people like Brody and Drew Gibson, that many other pros agree with them. That just aren't public with their thoughts. If so many apparently agree, why aren't they all stepping up to voice their opinion? How can we encourage growth and change the game if professionals are unwillingly, unwillingly to co publicly comment on something? Gary. Wow. Unwilling to publicly comment on something. Um, that's okay. Uh, here's the thing. Yeah, that one, and I, I think Brody would have a good a, the same answer for this, but yeah. that just comes down to they don't they can't ruffle feathers. Yeah. Um, I most people make a very have a very fragile livelihood and social environment on the disc golf tour. You're always mm -hmm. around the people. And I think a lot of the commentary around the game. Now I will say when it comes to saying things more related to the PDGA and the pro tour, I think that's one thing because saying stuff about other players, that kind of commentary, that's easy to understand why people don't get involved. Yeah. When it comes to talking more about changes in the sport and um, stuff with the pro tour course design, I actually think it's interesting because if you do, I think a lot of them just don't bother. Because if you ever listen to Tour Life, they get a lot of pros on there who speak pretty candidly. And you hear things you don't usually hear. Yeah. Because um, there are quite a few, like, you just ask them about it. They'll talk to you about things. Um, but I think that, yeah, maybe enough of them just don't often use the platform. I think another big one is the media structure within the Pro Tour, their press conference structure, where... They're just asking the questions, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. when do we get when do you get most of the sound bites and real opinions out of a sports professional? Right after a game, sometimes a frustrating one, mm -hmm. asked by reporters and journalists who know what they're doing. Yeah. And know what questions to ask. I I mean, <laughs> if we had that going on on the Pro Tour, we would hear things every year that would just blow us away. Like yeah. there would be some uh, much different takes circulating if right after uh, Gannon Burr was playing a course he didn't like and shot five over. Uh, if we asked some really, we really dug into that. Or, or if somebody on Gannon's card was clearly having a bad day and Gannon was playing slow, if we mm -hmm. asked about that, like that, that's I think where a lot of it comes from. Um, but yeah, I think it, I think there's definitely a pretty big population of players who just aren't willing to uh, ruffle any feathers. No, that makes total sense. Yeah, there's definitely a kind of band a band of people on tour that are all kind of together and i get it they're all together a lot of the time so that makes sense but i think that there definitely needs to be and i think the pro tour does a better job than the pdj at taking player feedback because mm -hmm. they do you know have like facebook groups and and surveys and things like that and i think we see real input there um <clears throat> but the pdga you know 
I won't say they're a coup, but people are talking about it. Mm. Um, we had a few questions to wrap up from the viewers that I wanted to bring up. All right. um, always got to give shout out to the viewer submitted questions. Make sure to click the link in the description if you want to submit a topic for our last few episodes. So this viewer said, watching the MVP open, it seemed like the disc went into spectator areas often. Should all spectator areas be OB to prevent the disc from hitting spectators and to prevent Umbrella Gate? Um, we actually got mm. to play the hole where Umbrella Gate happened. Yep. It was very exciting. Um, and how close do you think spectator areas should be to OB? Yeah, that's a tough one because I also think about at uh, GMC yeah. when we had that skip and those two kids were sitting there. Mm -hmm. And that's another one of like, man, why would, why would, first of all, what parents are letting their kids sit in a skip zone <laughs> on a hole? Get out of the skip zone. You know, <laughs> get out of there. But, um, I think that we have to think very carefully about where the balance is between the excitement that the fans being so close creates. Mm -hmm. I like that fans are so close. I think it adds this tension, this pressure yeah. to see fans get so involved in the sport is fantastic. But yeah, at what point does someone get hit and you have a lawsuit on your hands? I, mean, I know like you've got insurance and protections, but like at what point do we have to take people's safety into account? And um, I don't know that – I feel like this problem is persistent every year when we get to Maple Hill. Like we talk well, about this every single year. The woods – and the woods – the problem is in the woods you can't do – you can only do so much because it's not yeah. going to be an OB-heavy course. You're going to have to stack people in the trees. I think if, if you ever watch a golf tournament, the ball is hit into the crowd all the times, and it is stopped all the – like when a ball is – a drive is hit into a crowd of 100 people mm – -hmm. It, it doesn't get like it stops like it's going to run into somebody and not go as far out as it would have. Why do you not really notice it as much? Because it's a tiny golf ball and it's being shot from the air and you're not really seeing it happen. Yep. So I think it's a lot easier for people to kind of brush off disc golf. It's very apparent. Mm -hmm. The disc is big. There's not a lot of people in the crowd when it squares somebody up. It's very apparent. And also, I think just the way the game is played with golf, getting that kind of break Usually it's not keeping you from out of bounds. It might just keep you out of a tree line mm -hmm. or going further into the rough. I think that's the thing in disc golf. It's usually can be OB versus not OB. Um, but also, yeah, I think it's just so much less apparent because it's a tiny golf ball and you're yeah. not really seeing it happen as much. So people are just kind of like, they just kind of accept it as part of the game. Because I think that's another thing too, is if disc golf crowds were humongous and just always surrounding fairways. I think you just accept it more as part of the game. Like sometimes it just goes in the crowd and hey, thank thank goodness that guy was standing there. Like yeah. and it also too disc golf fairways are so much narrower, right? Yeah. So sure. like in, in golf, you may have a hundred yard wide fairway. So by the time you get out there, you mm -hmm. know, it is what it is. Whereas in disc golf, you can only be 20 feet 30 feet off of the fairway and then you're already running into that wall of people and i think that also kind of is an interesting visual yeah and i think it has to come down to planning too because there's a difference between spectators in an area where a disc can fly and spectators in an area that is a known landing zone right uh so like you've got a you know the things like umbrella gator i remember that time at um I think it was North Cove when Jeremy Colling hit a spotter's bag and it kept him from coming back in bounds. Mm -hmm. Like that kind of stuff, you've got to think ahead as a, as a course designer, as a tournament director. Where are we taking these people? Where are the fans going? Are we not allowing fans to advance up the fairway until drives are taken? And we just got to be smart about it. But to say let's let's get people out of these areas, I mean, think about European Open. And seeing the people line the fairways, yeah. that's like the pinnacle of what we, it's amazing. You, you got to get the people close to the sport at the yeah. end of the day. And so there are risks that come with that and some weird breaks, but ultimately they're going to happen if you want to get, if you want to prioritize the fans and, and you need to it to some extent. Exactly. Um, because at the end of the day, how often is it that we see something like this happen? Once, twice a year? That something, and how often is it something super important? Almost never. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not like uh, anyone was grabbed because they thought they were selling cookies at Hole 8. We, we, you know, we play a sport where you can miss your target by five feet and miss all the trees, and you can miss your target by an inch and kick 100 feet right. Exactly. So, like, <laughs> there, there just is always going to be an element of luck. I do agree, yes, control it as well as you can, but I think that trying to solve that problem is just a losing game. Yeah, So Exactly. Um, okay, the other question we had from the viewers, uh, I thought this was interesting. So this is about keeping the tour challenging. With more and more courses becoming birdie fest, could the best way to keep things challenging be to constantly change venues um, 
that way players have to learn a course through a weekend. We saw courses like Waco, Northwood, Gold, Austin, Worlds, European Open, challenge players the first day, and then lower the second time through. So obviously completely facelifting a venue every single year doesn't make any sense. But I do mm -hmm. think that it is an interesting concept to make enough changes to almost stall the field <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Um, now, the tough thing is you always want courses to be memorable. I think one of the problems with venues that change too often is you're basically saying it's never going to be super menu memorable and iconic because mm -hmm. you're just learning a new track all the time. But what I do not hate is the idea of just little difficulty adjustments yeah. or just something that adds a little nuance in a few different places throughout the course that maybe gives uh, everybody enough trouble to kind of set them back, like give them something new to process each year. I don't mm -hmm. mind that. Yeah, there's something to be said for when something is brand new for pros. I, I talked about this before, how one of the best like two week stretches of disc golf content we've gotten in the last few years is preparation for worlds this year yeah. because so many pros were coming out with practice rounds and analyzing the courses. Like when's the last time we got to see pros really have to dig deep and Very learn fun. something new on a big stage, yeah. which I think is a lot is, is really fun. I think Maple Hill did a good job this year of, of making little changes. I mean, yeah. three holes were tweaked mm -hmm. and I think it made a, a world of difference. I I've played that new pin on hole uh, nine and it's, it's so much fun. Yeah. Very, very difficult. And the new the new uh, setup on seven was great. So many people were talking about how much better of a hole it was, getting away from the road, making it a real golf shot. And honestly, people may you know feel differently about this, but the the par three on hole one, I'm I'm, I'm not against that. It, it was okay. A it couple was rounds. a fun hole. Yeah. You know, uh, I do think that. Yeah, there is something beautiful about watching players master a course in the span of a tournament. Yeah. Especially Worlds with it being a five-round tournament. By the mm -hmm. end of it, you just saw a different level of play at the same venue. Um, I do think one thing that... Because like you can't get too extreme with this. We do want to see familiar uh, stops on tour. But one thing that is a kind of a smaller way to implement this is by rotating uh, events in and out, kind of like we're going to see them do next year mm -hmm. um, by by not having Jonesboro or not having DDO. Um, yeah. Giving certain courses even a year off will help um, kind of establish that too because, okay, let's say DDO doesn't happen next year um, for and then it happens the year after. For any rookies that come in next year, not only are they not going to know the course uh, their rookie year, like they won't play it until their second year. So they'll almost be... They'll be that year's rookie class playing it for yep. the first time and the previous year's rookie class playing it for the first year. So you get this mm -hmm. whole host of players that haven't even played it in a tournament round uh, potentially. So I think that's a fun way to maybe have a few events that trickle in and out like that because mm -hmm. it is, it, it does make things interesting when you don't have courses that are super straightforward and people are trying to figure out their approach because you see such a variety of different shots. Yeah, and I think it emphasizes the importance of as the sport continues to grow and the tour continues to move on, we, we need to have less courses that are designed around properties and more properties that are designed to be courses because then you have the ability, like look at Maple Hill, look at some of these places that are disc golf courses, they have more flexibility to change pin locations, to, yeah. to make things a little bit different, to shake things up, as opposed to these other places that feel like they're only there for that weekend, right. and you can't, you just can't change anything. Yeah. So I, I think that's a big part of it, too. Certainly. All right. Well, that's all the questions we have. Hopefully you enjoyed this uh, little breakdown. It was fun to get into some of the questions from our own. I feel like... Uh, our panelists at this point really know what what stirs up things. They're they're pretty good at this, so maybe uh, maybe we'll have to have them submit topics more often. Yeah. They do a pretty good job. But next week we'll be back with another episode. Obviously, it will only be in a few days from now because we're uh, putting this out a little late in the week. Um, but things have been a little bit hectic. But we still have a few good episodes of Debate Night left before we transition into the off season podcast. I think the first episode will be coming out for that at, towards the end of October. So. Don't worry. You're still going to have your regular weekly podcast. It'll just look a whole lot different for the off season, but it'll be really fun. Make sure to click that link in the description, submit your topics, and we'll see you next week. Sal's even sitting over there. No, he left. He's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag do not recommend. Just have to stop the recording.